Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 178. You can't sleep. Broke people sleep. You got to be willing to sacrifice sleep. If you sleep, you're missing the opportunity to be successful. Eric Thomas. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Audible, and if you guys are like me, I'm constantly learning and reading as many things as I can, and sometimes I can't just sit down for hours and read a book, so I love listening to audiobooks. And Audible gives you one free audiobook that you can download and listen anywhere while you're on the go, while you're doing other work, and it helps you keep that education going, keeps you learning new things, and keeps you moving forward. And I've downloaded filmmaking books, screenwriting books, inspirational books, business books, all sorts of different books that that I listen to all the time. So just head over to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com and download your free filmmaking, screenwriting, or any kind of book you'd like. And today's show is also sponsored by my new course, Editing with DaVinci Resolve. I actually built an entire course on how I edited This Is Meg on DaVinci Resolve. So if you guys want to learn DaVinci Resolve and how to edit on DaVinci Resolve and take advantage of this free, that's right, free software that Blackmagic gives you, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Resolve Editing. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Resolve Editing. It is on sale for 15 bucks. It's normally 195 bucks, but for you guys, the listeners, the tribe, you get it for 15 bucks. And of course, it's part of the Indie Film Hustle's Master Circle membership. So if you're a member, enjoy it. It's already there waiting for you. If not, check out our Master Circle. It's an amazing membership site that I think you guys will get a lot out of. And I'm adding new courses every month. And I'm going to be cranking up new courses coming up in these next few months as well. So just go to IndieFilmHustle.com and hit the Master Circle button at the top. So today we have a very special guest. Uh, You know, I always talk about hustle and the grind and doing the work. And you just got to keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it. And today's guest is definitely an amazing example of that. Filmmaker Dylan Mars Greenberg has directed not one, not two, but six feature films. And I guess that's not too bad for a 19-year-old. You know, I know a lot of uh, 40 and 50-year-olds would you like to have six feature films under her belt, my, myself included. But I wanted to bring Dylan on the show to kind of show the energy of a young filmmaker who has just this amazing passion to create work and art and does not care about what other people think and just focuses on the work and keeps hustling, keeps pushing to make more and more art. And honestly, just an inspiration, I think, to uh, to all of us filmmakers out there. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Dylan Mars Greenberg. I'd like to welcome to the show Dylan Mars Greenberg, man. Thanks for being on the show. How are you doing? What's up? Oh, man, I'm excited to have you, man. It's been, uh, you, you reached out to me yeah. and told me your in, in kind of incredible story of uh, <laughs> a 19-year-old who has done six feature incredible. films. So uh, yeah. I want... I'm working on my seventh right now. Of course you are. Why wouldn't you be? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit about what made you want to be a filmmaker in the first place? What made me want to be a filmmaker was I would look at, um, I would watch tv and i would see uh just like things that i couldn't really explain and no one could really explain them to me um like i think actually one of the things was i was watching ever see free to be you and me Mm -mm, i'm not it's this tv movie it's a children's tv movie with marlo thomas i think i was like four okay and people there's just a part where people start disappearing Mm mm-hmm and it's like a stop cut, but I didn't I didn't know what that was. Sure. And so I was like, oh, my God, how are they doing that? <laughs> like, how are they? Because before that, I was just able to explain. Actually, I knew what computer animation was, but I didn't know what a stop cut was. Yeah. Um, right. It was magic. So, it was magic at that point to you. Yeah, it was magic. So I wanted to figure out how to do it. And my parents had an old VHS camera. Mm-hmm. I picked it up and I just basically just wouldn't put it down. I just kept 
filming stuff on it. So did you? I think I, I filled up all their VHS tapes. <laughs> what is this VHS tape you speak of? I don't understand. I'm joking. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you better know. I, I collect. I have like a mountain of VHS tapes. I, yeah. I collect them. Oh, very cool, very cool. So and um, did you just do a lot of? Did you shoot a tremendous amount of short films before you ever jumped into your first feature? Um, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I guess I tremendous. Yes. Bigly. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I, I shot a lot. I've, I'd been shooting, I'd been making little short films since I, I was like, I don't know, like eight or nine. Mm-hmm. Well, really like six, but when I started making them consistently, I would have been like nine. I mean, they were terrible. Right. Um, and I started a YouTube channel when I was about nine called D- Dilly, D-Y-L-I. Mm-hmm. And I think on that channel, I, I made like 300 so videos oh, wow. um, from the time I was nine to the time I was maybe like 15. Um, and that kind of became my project for like six years was making like videos that I mean, I thought they were fucking the best thing to ever happen since sliced bread. Of course. Looking back at it now, it's, a, it's a little kid making videos and windows movie maker. But, uh, oh my God. I was going to uh, ask you what you were editing on. Oh my God. Windows movie. Yeah, maker. I started. Well, you know what? I actually windows movie maker, I think is a great tool for people to start out with. And I think it's a lot better than iMovie. I think every young filmmakers first computer should be a windows and they should start with windows because it's a great program and it actually has some similarities to final cut. Mm -hmm. Then I would say, then you start making the transition to final cut. I made the mistake of, I went from windows movie maker. Then I got a Mac. Then I used iMovie. Then I went to to final cut. iMovie couldn't do as much Mm -hmm. to me, in my opinion, because windows movie maker, I would, I would deck out with all these plugins I could get for free. I had an XP computer. That's an, older model sure and so i was able, i figured out how to do chroma key i figured out how to do how to do split screen like matte split screen effects so i was doing stuff where i would stop motion animate a model on one side of the screen and use force perspective to make it look bigger mm-hmm. and then the other side of the screen i would have the live actors cowering at it looking up like you know it's forced perspective sure and so then i split screen the, the stop motion model into a you know uh, it would make him look like they were there at the same time that's awesome, man. I mean, that's just yeah. that's pure movie magic at that point. You're just yeah, having yeah. fun. I mean, it was so thrilling as a little kid figuring out new special effects. I can't think of anything more thrilling than that, honestly. Now, how old were you when you first uh, shot your first feature? My first feature, I was 17 years old. Okay. And you, wait a minute. You're, how old are you now? 20. I just so, turned 20, actually. S- after I sent you the email saying I was 19, I turned 20. So you, you've you <laughs> shot six features in three years? Yes. Very interesting. Oh, man, I mean, what, cam- what camera are you shooting with, by the way? I shoot with a Canon Rebel T2i. I've shot all of my movies save for one on a Canon Rebel T2i. Okay. And, and, you, uh, and you're editing on Final Cut? X? Yeah, every movie I've ever made, I've edited on Final Cut Pro 7. Oh, you're still on 7? Oh, man. I'm still on 7. But you know what? At Troma, we're still on 7. I work for Troma. Uh-huh. At Troma, we're still on 7, too. And well, it's very good. We edited the new movie, Return to Return to Return to Newcomb High, uh-huh. on Final Cut 7. Oh, no, don't don't get me wrong. I was I was a Final Cut 7 guy till probably a year and yeah. a half ago, two years ago. Yeah. So I, I jumped over sense. to Da Vinci. Um, but da Vinci? I've actually never heard of that. Da Vinci Resolve, where they... Oh, I've never heard of that. You should look into Da Vinci Resolve. I should definitely look it up. Thank it's, you. I'm it's learning free. A it's a free software you could get. It's uh, free? It's free, and it's the most powerful wow. color grading wow. system and editing system you could probably get Wow! Uh, right now. I mean, a color grading for sure, but I've edited... I just can edited my feature on it. framing? Oh, like, you, I do a lot of yes. key framing. Yeah, you okay, so it's becoming a commercial for... For editing systems, but no, yes. I'm I'm really excited for that. Just wow. look. Gonna, just type in type in Black Magic Resolve <laughs> in Google, and you okay. can download their free version, which is pretty powerful. Um, wow, thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> now I'm assuming you edit everything okay. yourself. Yes. Yeah, I've edited all my movies myself, all my feature films. How many hats do you wear on your films? Um. I'd say about three. I have a snapback. I have a beanie. I actually have, don't mean um, a hat. Rag. No, I'm just kidding. I know. I know. I'm just kidding. Um, I, uh, I, um, so I, I direct, um, which I think is the easy part, actually. I yeah. think, um, you know, that's just where you get to sit in a chair and, and, and go and go action. Um, but then I, I shoot everything. 
um, I, uh, I, um, I light, I usually light everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and what do you, li- and why do, why do you, what do you light with just basically a lot of practicals or do you have a um, lighting kit? I have, I have, no, no, I don't have quite a lighting kit. Um, my first few films, well, f- my, actually my first three movies, I, um, only had, <laughs> um, I only had just the light that was there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So that doesn't count. But um, actually, midway through my third movie, I met the man who would eventually become my producer, who at that time was just an actor, mm-hmm. um, uh, Jurgen Monster. And um, he uh, brought some lights with him. So the last maybe like third of my movie, Dark Prism, which is my most well-known one, mm-hmm. I, uh, I was able to light, but they were like stage lights. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then my next film, I lit the whole thing with those same lights, stage lights. And then my my sixth feature film, because um, actually one of them came out out of order. One mm-hmm. of them came out. It was actually would have. It's a long story. I'll get into it after. But um, <laughs> It's OK. My, anyway, my most recent feature film was the first where I've entirely um, lit it with a combination of stage lights. And also I have a small it's one of the most useful. As this is something if the filmmakers listening, this is one of the most useful tools. Um, I got it was thirty bucks. It's a portable uh, LED light mm-hmm. for filming. You can get it on Amazon. I mount it to my camera. It's so bright. It, 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 takes, it takes six AA batteries. It's one of the most useful things I've ever gotten. Mm-hmm. I have one of those. They're great. Yeah, the newer. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god, fantastic! Right? They're awesome. They're awesome. Yeah. Now with all these features, I'm assuming yeah. you you did some sort of distribution. Oh, and I compose. I'm sorry, and I compose and, music, and I compose. And music. you're the composer as well. Not so, all of it. Uh, but but you one compose of the composers. But when you're I, the composer, I crowdsource a lot of music from a lot of great musicians. So mm-hmm. a lot of the music is songs from all different bands all over the place. But some a lot of the instrumental music. I compose myself. Now, how do you fi- how do you finance your films? Um, mostly out of pocket. My newest film, I got some financial help from a wonderful company called Wendigo Productions, who also financed um, one of my favorite indie films, uh, Candy Apple, mm-hmm. um, which recently uh, I think is is coming out soon to video for mm-hmm. indie picks. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they gave me a little bit of money to help me finish, and and my, and my new one also Brooklyn Fireproof. Uh, they didn't give me money, but they gave me a lot of resources. So yeah, but most of it is out of pocket. People help me out. I get a lot of favors. Um, my producer also, he, it's not like we, he gives me actual, like he does not, doesn't just put cash in my hand, mm-hmm. but he really helps me out with other stuff. Resources. That saves me money. Yes. So resources are really more important ultimately than money, honestly. Just because money buys resources. So if you exactly. kill the exactly. middleman, you're fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, let me ask you just a simple question. What made you think as a 17-year-old you know, kid, I'm going to yeah. go make my first feature? Like what gave you the kind of courage I didn't to think go- that. I didn't think that. Okay, so here's what happened. I had written a totally different feature, mm-hmm. and I kept telling everyone, oh, I'm going to make my first feature. This is the script. And they were like, oh, yeah, right. You'll never get this one made. And they were right because they never got it made. Um, that summer, I was planning on making that one as a feature film. It was a rock musical. I had recorded all the music for it already called Shock and Roll Terror. Mm-hmm. And I'm honestly glad I didn't make it because it would have been awful because the music was bad. I'm, I'm a better musician now. Mm-hmm. At the time, the music was very, very bad. Um but I was going to shoot the whole thing in three or four days in one house. The problem was that it's supposed to be rock and rollers stuck in a in a like a house in the middle of the woods. But I live in New York City, so that would have been very impossible. <laughs> yeah. um, They're not a lot of woods um, other than Central not Park. Woods. Not a lot, unless well, you're shooting I, I in Central did Park. Live, I actually did live in sort of the woods in New York City for two years in Staten Island. And actually, I shot Amityville Vanishing Point there. Uh-huh. Um, but anyway, what ended up happening was... Um, I started making this very experimental short film, um, which did not have a title. And I was basically just filming stuff of uh, my friend Briar, um, who's a very uh, beautiful, skinny boy, mm-hmm. and, uh, and some stuff with him on a rooftop and with a doll. And it was all very, very experimental. And then I looked and I had about 30, 40 minutes of that. I had about 30 minutes of footage, I think, from that. And I was like, well, why don't I make it 40 minutes? Because I want there to be other stuff besides just him. I shot stuff with these girls, and they cover themselves in blood, and they're eating, uh, and they're eating, <laughs> uh, and they're eating chicken wings, and they're making out, sure, and, sure. Uh, and uh, vomiting yogurt. And I, and then I thought, okay, 
well, now that's like 45 minutes. So if I just, just keep kept, going, if, <laughs> if I just kept going, I could make a 70 minute feature film. So then I was like, well, listen, if I'm going to make my first feature, why don't I get some peop- some stars involved? Um, so I, I reached out to Jacob Reynolds, uh, who uh, is the star of Gummo, mm-hmm. Harmony Korean's Gummo. Yeah, I remember And Gummo. I said, hey, yeah. would you be able to help me out? I'm making my first feature film. I had revised a fantasy novel for him. He wrote a fantasy novel. Mm-hmm. And I, when I was 15, out of because I was such a fan of his, I revised the entire 248-page uh, fantasy novel mm-hmm. um, uh, for free. So I said, hey, would you be able to help me out and shoot a little cameo for my movie? He lives in, I think, North Carolina, mm-hmm. so he couldn't come to me. So he shot stuff of himself uh, reading lines I'd written for him. And then I and then I made it a plot point where I film it through a television. Mm-hmm. So it's like he's talking to the viewer through the television. Um, and then I also got Matthew Silver, who is a... One of the most, I think at this point, one of the most well-known performance artists, um, I would say, um, in the city and probably even in America and in mm-hmm. the world because he's getting really popular. And mm-hmm. uh, he was just in car- with Carl Pilkington mm-hmm. and um, uh, and uh, was just on Adult Swim. He re- So he gets around. So he agreed to also uh, help me out. And this was all favors. I didn't have a dime to my name at the time. Mm-hmm. And so before I knew it, I had made my first 70 minute feature film. It was very abstract. It was, you know, pretty, pretty much something that you project on a wall. It's not really something. It's, I, I would not totally consider something you could sit down and watch. Mm-hmm. I've only actually ever screened it once, but that gave me the guidance where I said, okay, now I know how to make a feature film. Now I've gotten started. That, that, so you basically just fell into your first feature film. I fell into my – exactly. And then from there, I'm like, well, now I don't want to stop making feature films. Because now you're like, well, this is easy. Let me just keep making them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, yeah, actually the first one was easy. That's what I thought it was easy because I because I didn't have to have a plot or anything. Right. It was just so more like, of an experimental so situation. Why don't, I, why don't I make another one? The right. next one took me a, a, like about a year to make because it was – I tried to actually – I got a little more ambitious. Right, exactly. Now, do, how do you tra- how do you like make money with your films? Do you tra- you you uh, self distribute? What do you do? <laughs> I self distribute. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. I am um, I uh, I use Amazon Video Direct, mm-hmm. and I get my movies on Amazon. I use VHX. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have my own channel on VHX called DiscPictures.VHX.TV. That's D I S C K mm-hmm. Pictures. And then I am. Um, Give some of my, and then I, I, I've given a, quite a few of my films to a great uh, indie film service called um, iBladeIndie.com, mm-hmm. and they're a video on demand site. I think they're hosted initially by Vimeo on demand, mm-hmm. and then they can, and then they distribute films, and they give, and they are very fair. They only take ten percent, and then they give filmmakers ninety percent of the royalties. Mm-hmm. Um, so between those three avenues, I've been able to make a little bit of money. Mm-hmm. Um, how is most of my money? Yeah, you know how is Amazon? How do you? What's your feeling on Amazon? Have you? Is it worth it? I think it's definitely worth it because that's where you're going to make. You need to. Sometimes you're going to need to go with mainstream uh, options to make money. Mm-hmm. And Amazon, it's it's a hassle, and you're going to have to pay mm-hmm. to get your movies closed captioned. By the way, but by the way, if you a, yeah. if you want to get them closed captioned for a dollar a minute, use Rev.com. Rev, yep, that's what I use. Yeah, yeah Rev.com. Um, absolutely, I use that all the time. Um, actually, for one of my movies, I co-directed with my godmother. We, uh, my godmother was really broke, um, and uh, she she uh, you might know about her. Ever seen if you've seen the trauma movie Terra Firmer? Okay. Um, she's in that. Uh, her name's yeah. Reverend Jen, and she's she's done a few other things, mm-hmm. but um. Uh, yeah, at the screening of the movie, we took her on a bucket to raise money for Rev. So mm-hmm. it was a closed captioning fund. So at the end, we made seventy five bucks, and we could get a closed caption. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, what, what's what's what what is the the where do you see most of your revenue come from? Amazon, absolutely. I mean, in terms of my feature films, Amazon. For sure. Really, Am- just and that's just play. You're on Amazon Prime, or you or are you renting and selling? You're gonna make most of your money from renting and and selling. Okay. Um, uh, I have some of my movies on Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime, you're not going to make a lot of money for. It's good for exposure, but you're not going to make a ton of money. It, you're going to make the most money if you ha- charge two ninety nine per download. People are a lot more willing to pay that if it's on a site that they recognize. For of course, of course, and that's why, and that, and that's where you drive most of your traffic. 
of people that you tell people about? Yeah, I would say, yeah. Most of the traffic of people seeing my movies has come from Amazon. Got it. Now, I, I heard you're, you got hooked up with uh, Troma a little bit. How, would, uh, yeah. how did you get, how'd you get hooked up with Troma? Well, I started interning for them out of high school. Mm -hmm. um, while I was still in high school, um, I, at this point, I had made two feature films. And uh, so they, they really liked having me there. And they saw I can really – I really know how to edit because, like I said before, I've been editing since I was about nine. Mm -hmm. um, so I do kind of – I edit in kind of a crazy way that maybe a more mainstream editor might not uh, do where I, I do kind of animations. I'm very inspired by things like Tim and Eric, the Eric Andre show. So they saw what I can do with animating, with animating things and, and, you know, kind of editing in a kind of an alternative way that maybe someone else wouldn't. And they said, why, why would you, how would you like to be a full-time editor here? So I've been an editor there now for about two and a half, three years. Oh, very cool. And then that's how, yeah. and, and now is trauma distributing any of your films? No, I think that we're going to, we're going to talk about, uh, one of them, which I actually want to give them my most well-known one so that they can make some, some money from. I don't want to give them a lemon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, yeah, we're going to be discussing it soon. But right now, I'm currently self-distributing. But I'm certainly open to talking to them about it. And you know uh, one of our former guests of the show, Kansas Bowling, correct? Yeah, Kansas, of course. Yeah, her and I are good friends. She's in my new movie. Is she? And your new, what's the name of your new movie? It's called Reagitator, Revenge of the Parody. It's a two-hour <laughs> epic. Uh, a two-hour epic. <laughs> it's a two-hour epic, yeah. That's awesome. Kansas is great. She yeah. is very inspiring oh, as well. Oh, she's lovely. Yeah, absolutely uh, wonderful she, person. Shot her first film on 16 millimeter for Yes, God's I sense. know. BC Butcher. Yeah, it's fantastic. And has it done well? How, do you know? Has it, has it done well with Troma? It's, I think it's actually Troma's one of their most successful movie, uh, movie that Lloyd did not direct since Father's Day. Wow, that's awesome. People that's are really awesome. into it. I'm very happy for Kansas, and she's really making waves in the film industry. That's and great. also, I'm very proud that my starring actress from the movie Dark Prism, mm -hmm. actually, I got them hooked up. And um, now, um, actually, that Sophie Cote, who I consider the original, uh, you know that actress, Cara Delevingne? I, I do not. I do not. Sophie Cote, is, she's in that movie Valerian that's coming out. Oh, very um, nice. The girl with it, that's not her, it's, um, uh, it's, Sophie Cote is the original Cara Delevingne, mm -hmm. however you pronounce her name, and, uh, and I hooked them up, and Sophie, I think, just starred in a movie that Kansas wrote mm -hmm. in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. called, I think it's called Primavera, or, or something along those lines, and I'm very excited to see that, because I'd awesome. like to see Sophie in a movie that I didn't direct, I'm very excited. <laughs> now, what's your next movie? My next movie is called Spirit Riser. I, I'm sorry. I, I think I, I yeah. I'm, I just want to make sure I answered your question properly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um, yeah. My next movie is called Spirit Riser. Um, it's gonna be my biggest film yet. We already have shot scenes with Lynn Lowry from uh, David Cronenberg Shivers. Mm -hmm. um, we shot and we shot scenes with a lot of up and coming stars and and, and uh, internet stars. Uh, Patty Harrison, who's one of the who is a, she's really going to become a, a big comedian. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she was on Seriously.TV and a lot of other great sites, and she's very funny. We shot scenes with her. We shot scenes with Dorian Electra, who, um, who's made several uh, incredible, very beautiful viral videos. They're not just, you know, kid gets hit in the nuts. She, she mm -hmm. has sets and, and, and makes music and does some really cool stuff. Nice. And, um, and um, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. And Matthew Silver, who was actually... In my first feature. Oh boy, sorry, I have a bit of a cough. No worries. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, so we're working on that. It's about a little girl who can resurrect spirits from the dead. The little girl is played by my my own sister, Summer. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and and when her family is killed by an evil cult, she uh, has to kind of rediscover her powers and uh, use them to save her her foster family. So it's both a film about. Ghosts in a horror film, but it's also kind of a film about about love. Nice and it's a film about, and it's a film about sort of about uh, overcoming grief and about forgiveness, um, and sort of how people can appear kind of cold on the outside, but on the inside they might be kind of in pain. So it's actually my, going to be my most emotional film I think I've ever made. Now you obviously you're building an audience uh, for your work, correct? I would say so. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my god. Um, yeah, I'd say I'm building a, a bit of an audience. Um, actually, today, because I, I mean, I'm also a bit well known as a musician, mm -hmm. and today, um, 
someone. I have a music video that actually I made in co to coincide with my movie Reagitator. And just like today, I saw someone message uh, one of my friends or something and was like, oh, my God, you were in a Dylan Mars video? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I didn't know that a Dylan Mars video was a thing. Like, I didn't even know that. <laughs> you know, like, I, I know that. I understand. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Yeah. You're like, what? The people, like, I was what? Like, I'm that well known. Like, people, like, people, like, I, like I'm a noun. That's awesome. You know? That's awesome. Now, let me yeah, ask you. Yeah, I, I, so I ask you three. Uh, I'm going to ask you three questions. I always ask all of my, uh, yeah. my guests. What okay. advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to make their first feature film? Okay. I would say this is what I see a lot of. Of young filmmakers going through is they and when you and when you say and when you yeah. say young you're 20 so let's just keep it in perspective. <laughs> well, sometimes they'll be like 10. Actually, well, no, no, no. Actually, sometimes they'll be older than me, but that doesn't mean that they're not oh young. young filmmakers, but not young in age, young in the business. Got it? No, no. I'm saying, I mean, I mean, young in age. You can be 21 and still young. I'm not sure, saying sure. that. I'm not saying younger than me. Yeah, I got I'm you. Got you. We're both we're both young. Got um, it. But yeah, also young in the business, and they'll and they'll be like, oh, I want to make my first feature. This is the script, and they'll show it to me. And I mean, it's ridiculous. It's got it's got it's it's a it's a it's a three million dollar movie. They want stars. They don't, or even if they want like fifty thousand dollars, you're not gonna unless you're you're rich, you're not gonna have that money. Right. And so I think the, your first feature, try to make something very low budget, but still try to make it compelling. Which I mean, I didn't even. I mean, my first feature film, I would not call it compelling, mm -hmm. but. But you, you don't even have to – don't worry about the quality. Just make it so that you know how to do it. That it, Now it's like a template for you to keep doing it. And it's, keep a, it's a process. And you keep learning every time you make something. You keep, exactly. You keep learning. And my movies get – with every movie I make, they become better and better. So yeah, I would just say don't, don't wait up. It's really – it's all about just don't wait up for money. And mm -hmm. you know maybe you can even do the same ideas but do them on a lower budget even if they look silly – it's better to look silly than to never make anything at all. Oh, you know, consequence amen. Of sound, <laughs> consequence of Sound kind of tore into one of my movies, mm -hmm. and they called it low budget and stupid, and mm -hmm. and and uh, and like and just like like and just like no one wants to see it. And but the really the main reason was because it was silly. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with with making a movie that's silly. People like seeing things that are silly. People need something that's silly. I mean, trauma's bu trauma's built an entire empire around that. Exactly on silly. <laughs> exactly. Well, trauma's movies though they have a very serious. Uh, they do so messages. absolutely. Toxic they, Avenger yeah. alone is a, yeah. I mean amazing. Yes, absolutely. Toxic Avenger alone is amazing in in, in, in yeah. his political statement at that point. Uh, but yeah, oh, but but so they hide it. But they hide it within. Sometimes very silly concepts. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so but yeah, just but yeah, don't expect that you're gonna make the big Tarantino movie that uh, is you know you're gonna have you know it's not like the early '90s where you could actually get someone to give you even thirty thousand dollars. You're not gonna get any money. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to figure out ways to to fund it. I mean, you're not really just don't even worry about fund. Just if you have a camera and an editing system, then you can make a feature film. You can do it, and just don't let anything hold you back. And, you know, don't wait up for something that isn't going to happen. That's awesome, man. That's really great advice, honestly. For someone so young Sorry, to understand I, yeah. that is awesome because it took me I, years I to it, learn that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I said it. I was a little incoherent. I, I did an interview with Wemo where I said sort of the same thing, but it was a text, so they were able to cut it down. <laughs> it's all good. Um, it's all good. It's all yeah. good. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in your life? Lesson that took me the longest to learn? Hmm. I would say, I don't know, because I'm kind of a, I'm maybe just don't be stubborn. I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm a Taurus. I'm very stubborn. So sometimes mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like to change and sometimes I, I should, but I'm just trying to think of something a little grander than that. Something that would really, you'd be able to carry with you besides just a general thing that a grandma would say to you. Got um, it. Got it. Uh, Listen, that it took me to, that's a really deep question. Uh, we, we try, we try here on the show. <laughs> to learn. Um, you know what? I'll say this much. Um, it wasn't so much when I was making feature films as it was when I wasn't because I, the lesson that took me the longest to learn was that a movie should be made in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I thought that really, cause I went to, I, I never went to film school college, but I went to film school classes as a kid and they really drill into your skull that a movie should be made a certain way. You have to do it this way. You know, 
you know, you have to know all the terms. You have to have all the equipment. You have to do it just right. You have to have mm-hmm. the, a best boy grip and the and the mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and the and you a separate cinematographer that isn't you and such sure. and such. And I, then for a while, I actually got discouraged and didn't make short films for a while when I was a kid. Uh, and then what changed that was actually my godmother sort of opening my eyes to the movies that she's made. Um, she's she makes very alternative movies, and that sort of taught me. Wow, you can make a movie and it really does not have to follow any rules. You can really just break the rules mm-hmm. and make something totally alternative and strange. You don't have to, you know, make the next. You don't have to make Reservoir Dogs Part Two. You know, right? Exactly. So, uh, there's, there's enough people trying to do that in the world. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what I'm. I mean, Reservoir Dogs is a great movie, but now everything has to be a carbon copy of your favorite of of Quentin Tarantino or or. Uh, or you know Warner Herzog or mm-hmm. Herzog. well Warner Herzog is a very well they're both alternative directors but you know what I'm saying I got you I got you um, now what are three of your favorite films of all time three of my favorite films number one off right off the bat Forbidden Zone you ever seen Forbidden Zone I've heard of Forbidden Zone I've never saw it oh my god I, I, I there are not many movies I would get a tattoo of this mm-hmm. is a movie I have a tattoo of <laughs> um, it's uh yeah it's it's stylized it's one of the most stylized films I've ever seen directed by Richard Elfman mm-hmm. um uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it makes the Rocky horror picture show look like Bambi. Like it, it's, wow. it's so it's, I think it's one of the best cult films. It's, uh, all the sets are built to look like a 1930s, uh, movie set. Mm-hmm. I, or like a, a 1930s, like, oh, they look like a 1930s cartoon. All the music is by Oingo Boingo before they were famous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and it's a musical with music by Oingo Boingo. Herve Valetchez is the star, which is incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just honestly I can't think of I, I that's the that's one movie I've seen more times than I've seen any other movie. Got it. Um so that's that's definitely my number one favorite. You said three, right? Yeah, just a couple more is fine. Whatever comes okay, to your head. Three. Okay. Um three. Um I would say uh one of my favorite movies is oh damn. Now I'm having now I'm having a uh, It's all good. It's all good. One 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 really good one is all we need. You don't need to get all three if you don't want. Well no, I'm just trying to see well I will I'd say Gummo. That really influenced me as a kid. Mm-hmm. Harmony Corinne's Gummo. That's definitely one of my favorites. Um and uh I'm just trying to think of one more. Um yeah, go, um yeah, go, I mean, you know, just, it's it, just a, it, it 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 has a feeling in it that you can't get with a lot of other movies. There's something it, in Gummo that you makes you feel that it's this kind of terrifying but familiar feeling and you don't really get that very often. Now, um, um it's yeah. a, it's all right. So those two there's fine. Okay. Where uh, okay. now where can people find you? Online. You find me on uh, me online facebook.com/discmedia that's d i s c k media mm-hmm. um uh we're also we also just started a clothing line called disc threads mm-hmm. so that's d-i-s-c-k threads dot tumblr dot com mm-hmm. uh we also have uh, our vhx channel which is disc pictures d-i-s-c-k pictures dot v-h-x dot mm-hmm. tv and um and uh and you can also search for my movies on amazon prime my movies dark prism and Movie I co-directed with my godmother, Werewolf Bitches, Smatter Space, are both on Amazon Prime. Uh, Werewolf Bitches features Janine Garofalo, and Dark Prism features Mac DeMarco. That's um, awesome. Yeah, that's and, awesome. Um, well, yeah, I'll put all I'll put all the links to all the stuff in okay. the show notes for well, you, man. Okay. Also, wait. Also, one other thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also just want to plug we we uh, so we just have a completed feature film called Reagitator, mm-hmm. Revenge of the Parody. It's the two hour it's a two hour epic and it, it, it stars Aurelio Voltaire and Schooly D as the president of the United States and a cast of other incredible characters including Amanda Flowers, uh, who's a fantastic actress in the Tromet, and um, and uh, Jurgen Azazel Munster, who is also my producer, and a, a lot of other great, great actors. Oh and Kansas Bowling. Of course. Too. Of course. And um, and so we have that out. So message me at this is Dylan Greenberg at gmail.com if you want to show the movie in your bar, in your house, in your backyard, in your <laughs> toilet, in, in your and in, possibly in your theater. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you are oh. sir, you are the um, the definition of a hustle. So I'm a I'm a hustler. <laughs> uh, you are. So thank you so much for being on the show. I of really, course, really appreciate you. it.
Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm, this is one of the best interviews I think I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Dylan is an inspiration, and I wish I would have had Dylan's uh, access and experience at 19. I didn't even know what I wanted to do at 19, but to be able to produce six feature films working on the seventh is pretty remarkable. And I hope that Dylan's experience and what Dylan's doing really pushes you guys to go out there and make your own projects. That you, It doesn't have to be perfect. Movies don't have to be perfect. You just got to go out there and create and do and finish a project. Because if you're able to do that, you're you're in the 1% of the 1% of the 1% of filmmakers out there because you're not just talking about making a movie. You're actually going out there and making a movie, a series, a short, any kind of work. But just go out there and do it. And I want to thank Dylan for the inspiration that hopefully all of you guys out there listening will get from our conversation. To get the show notes, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 178. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 